Philippians was written by Paul while imprisoned, after he had gone through a lot of suffering. Um, he's in Rome at this point. Um, watch out for others at the expense of yourself, from chapter 2. Uh, being blame blameless isn't about <coughs> being perfect, but obeying God and not complaining. It was his whole point there. It was more about being a good example than being uh, perfect. And we looked at that. Um, rejoicing in the Lord is a safeguard. And it's okay to be concerned or sad. Even if you obey God, you will have struggles. Okay, so hopefully that will jog your memory on some of the stuff that we talked about. Unless you're Isaiah, <laughs> where you weren't here before. <laughs> but, uh, okay. So, before we get into Philippians, let, let's have a little short discussion here. What are your goals? What keeps you going? Why are, why are they your goals? Nobody has goals? I have goals, but I want other people to answer. <laughs> Zachary, what are your goals? Uh, I don't know. That's a good goal. <laughs> um, Somewhere on there's not die, maybe? You know? <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. Crazy? I really, oh, go ahead. I really don't. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, no, I mean... Crazy? Okay, um... So I guess some of my current goals are to reach the kids of Tularosa. Okay. Um, to not only be a good mom, but be a good role model as a mom. You know, like, um, as a, I, I really want to be like a, a, a godly mom, you know. I don't want my kids to grow up and be like... Well, let's shoot this place and get out of here. You know? um, and uh, what keeps me going? Um, well, with the kids of Tularosa, I, I see a change in some of the kids, and that keeps me going. And knowing that there's more out there needing help. Okay. And with the mom thing, I guess, um, seeing how other people have their relationships with their moms, including me, it, it kind of keeps me going and um, realizing what I need to change. And then, uh, why are they my goals? Um, the kids of Tularosa, uh, that one's my goal because um, God kind of gave it to me. Okay. Um, I mean, that's just plain and simple. I mean, like, there's nothing else around it. I'm, I'm not really good with, I, I don't think I'm very good at reaching kids. If it wasn't for God, I, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> well, what, what would Cartman say about it, you know? <laughs> How do I reach these kids? <laughs> And um, <laughs> why is the mom thing a goal? Because I don't want to get to be in my 60s and regret my kids, re regret the decisions I made. Are you saying that you're not 60? <laughs> oh, but wow. apparently I am. And that's I right. Oh, that's the kids in your class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was talking <laughs> to them. I was like 40, I'm like, what? what is this talking about? You're all looking at your face. You're like, where are these wrinkles that you're seeing? What? Oh, my yeah, hair isn't gray. Hair that old ladies have. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Nicole. I've never really thought about it. I've never okay. really sat and thought about it. So I mean. Okay. So there's nothing that like keeps you going. Nothing that like you want to accomplish in the future or you're working towards. Not right like now. Okay. But I think over the, like the next few weeks. I'll be really thinking about it. Okay. Um, especially with the new counsel that I'm going to be seeing. I know she's going to be wanting to, well, he will be wanting to really talk about it, so. Okay. Because that's definitely one thing. I, I guess that would be a goal, is to really set a goal. Okay. For the future. So. Can you, here, here's a question. Can you set a goal to set a goal for a goal? <laughs> okay. Things are getting confusing at that point, wow. huh? <laughs> Check. Um, I, I have several right now. Um, one would be, like Gracie said, reaching kids in the Okay. Making an impact on their lives. Um, that's pretty much a long-term, continuous goal that I have. Um, but also, like, impacting the community in general, mm -hmm. not just the kids, like. The adults too. Cares about the adults. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Cold. Uh, Heartless. Um, wow. 
Also, uh, finishing my schooling. Okay. That's a goal. Well, you're pretty close to that one. Yeah. Um. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All right. Isaiah, you got anything? Um. Well, my goal is to finish my uh, English class. Then I'm taking it at MSUA. Oh, very cool. Um. Until, um, until May, and afterwards, um, I'm gonna do some more. I'm gonna do some more basic courses before okay. I figure out what my major is because I have no idea. <laughs> and then, um, my second goal, um. <clears throat> I'd like to be able to live on my own someday and uh, hopefully support a family. What? Good goals. Yeah. Anything else? I would like to become a. Uh, I would like to form a band, like a metal band. Oh. So, uh, yeah. Never mind. I was gonna <laughs> say you could be called the Tuli Thrashers. <laughs> oh my God, that'd be so cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Nobody would come to our concert. Right? <laughs> you guys remember the 90s? Like, just the terrible names that were yes, in those bands? Yes. And I had to grow up with those bands, so, like, I had... <laughs> so, so, just a side note, uh, when I was talking to Joseph Rojas the other day, he said that one of their concerts that they first started out, like, he got booked to play in a bar, right? Uh-huh. And... The only two people that were there were these heroin addicts. Oh, God. <laughs> they were just like shooting up. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <What? laughs> That's, That's super awesome. Wow. I, I love how you name dropped right there, though. Huh? <laughs> I love how you name dropped right there, though. Yeah, I could do that again. <laughs> I, I don't know other names. <laughs> okay, so that takes us to Philippians. And I'll work in the whole goal thing here in just a little bit. So I, that there was a point to that. So we left off in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. And so I'll read the section before we get going on the specifics. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, and having a righteousness of my own, I'm sorry, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Now this is where we left off, uh, one, two, three weeks ago. So let's just kind of look at a few things. First off, in verse 7, it says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. So Paul has gotten rid of the things that he had, he had to be proud of, and instead took the shame of knowing Christ. It's kind of a constant factor um, that we see uh, throughout Paul's writings, is you know this kind of either-or mindset. And we're going to look at this a little bit more, but basically, um, he didn't see it as a possibility to hold on to your name and your pride and Christ. You know, he had this, like, kind of um, polarizing view. You know, it was either he kept his name as a, you know, devout Pharisee and a good person and all these things. <laughs> I think Teresa's escaping. Uh, or he took on the name of Christ. And that, to me, was kind of um, kind of a, um, a little bit hard of a pill for me to swallow because all of us um, sometimes have this idea that we want to get glory for glory's sake, you know, and... Um, you know, like, for instance, you know, I, I would like to, you know, uh, especially before I became a pastor, I really wanted to get into professional mu music with my guitar stuff. Um, I wasn't really interested in a band because I wanted to be the center of the, you know, center of the stage. <laughs> um, and I, I was in bands before, but it was for the sake of so I could use them as a stepping stone to <laughs> have people. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing bands. I mean, bands do a great, do a great thing, especially if you listen to, you know, Project 86, the best band in the world. Really? <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. I just said that because I, I know you said red. So, <laughs> um, okay. Um, so all these things. Um, more than that, I count all the all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. So all these things don't matter in view of Christ. And then in verse 9, 
and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So he basically says the same, same thing there twice about righteousness not coming from works. Did you notice that? He, it yeah. kind of, he kind of rewords it and repeats it. Mm -hmm. um, so we will lose um, – we will all lose everything we own and all our titles. See, this – I was I was actually doing a video on Facebook today, and one of the things that I talked about was, um, you know, we take pride in our titles of Republican or Democrat or you know this or that, but the the truth is that those things are are, are fading away, you know, even as even as we hold on to them, you know, I know a lot of people who take great pride in their businesses, and uh, you know they've worked their whole life to to earn you know every penny that they could, and then they end up you know, in their 60s or 70s, and saying, "I wasted my whole life trying to get a dollar, and now I'm gonna, I'm getting ready to go into my last stages of life and and, and die. And what am I gonna do with all this money?" You know, and I think sometimes we kind of lose the forest for the trees. You know, it, it's good to do things, but it's better to do something with a purpose. You know, like for instance, having a job or having a job where you're working and sharing Christ. You know. Um, if you listen to podcasts, uh, Project 86 actually has a podcast that they started, and uh, in there they were talking. A lot. They they talk here or there, but there was a whole episode about it, um, uh, being religious and being in a band, and uh, just some of the things that he said there. But anyways, I guess that's not really. Um, so uh, lose them for the sake of Christ. He says, count them as rubbish so that I can gain Christ. See, so he, he, he put a clear contrast there. Um, where is it? In verse um, 8. For, um, right here at the end of verse 8. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. See, he, he put them in clear contrast. I could have either been known as that Pharisee of Pharisees, been known by all my works of the law, or I could have gained Christ. So he counted them as rubbish so that he could gain Christ. Um, and that's one of the things that the Jews that he's talking about um, weren't getting. They were still thinking that the salvation was through that law, and they were still bragging about all their all their works of the law. Look at me, I'm circumcised. Look at me, I'm of this tribe. Look at me, I you know I have this noble birth and noble you know ethnic background and all this stuff. Um, and then in verse 9 where he says, And may be found in him not having righteousness of my own drive from the law. So not being seen as righteous, um, not not being seen as righteous, uh, such as the Jews, but receiving true righteousness. Sorry, true righteousness. So and may be found in him not having righteousness of my own drive from the law. So in other words, not being found as a Jew of Jews, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Um so then Paul clearly contrasts the righteousness of faith and the righteousness of works. Basically, he could either try and earn his righteousness through works, which we all know that's not possible, or he could earn his righteousness through faith in Christ. And he doesn't even really uh, give that strong of a defense here. It's like, it's like he's not trying to just argue for argument's sake at this point in the letter. It's like he's, it's, it's, it's almost like... You already, you guys already know what I believe about this stuff. I've already written, told you guys, I already, already explained this stuff to you. Now it's just like he's kind of, you know what I mean? Like he's just saying, you know, I, I've already explained this stuff to you guys. Now I just want to, uh, to focus on, uh, on the works that, I mean, on the, on the righteousness that's from faith, which comes from God uh, on the basis of faith. And then we get to verse ten. But uh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship is of his suffering, and being conformed to his death. Kind of a downer there, huh? <laughs> so Paul can only know him and his power by casting off his own goodness. So you see what he says there? He says, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, <coughs> that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. In other words, Paul could not know Christ and Christ's power by holding on to his goodness. He had to give up his own goodness, his own righteousness by works, so that he could truly know God. Now, I grew up in a very religious kind of – or legalistic religious atmosphere where I had to kind of always try to prove myself, try to – always try to win, win my salvation. You know, it's like I was saved by grace, but then I had to keep my salvation by works or something. And uh, um, 
there's a, a certain freedom that comes when you just give up your goodness. You know what I mean? Stop trying to earn that salvation because it, it, you'll never attain it. And when you finally cast that off, you finally know God in a new way that's just you were blinded to before. Um, and then in verse, um, so know him means to trust in him. In verse 10 here, that I may know him. Um, and then, um, so come to know him by experience, basically. And then he says that I may know the power of his resurrection. So this is obviously a contrast to the power in the flesh that the Jews and the Judaizers both had. Um, remember, Judaizers are those who are saying, okay, we need to add the works of the Jews to the faith of uh, basically Messianic Jews of nowadays. It is a very similar pattern. You know, we, we have to add works to the salvation, like what I was talking about, and the Jews who didn't believe in Christ. So, um, so not in the power of the flesh, but in the transformation of the flesh. So in other words, our, our confidence, confidence is knowing that we will, be res we will be resurrected in the next life. That our failures and our shortcomings don't matter in view of faith in Christ. So the same power at work in Jesus' resurrection is working in us. That I may know the power of, of the resurrection. And then the next thing he says is that I may know the fellowship of his suffering. We don't really think of that too much. The fellowship of his suffering. The the the, the fellowship of his like what is that? What does that mean? Like that doesn't sound like a good thing, does it? Um, pouring ourselves out for others. This is this is the fellowship of the suffering when people wrong us, and we are suffering for the name of Christ, and we're enduring. We know God in a new way when we go through those things. It, there's a certain fellowship that happens with God and with each other that happens when we're when we're going through suffering. In the in the case of the Philippian church, remember they're going through hard times, and so is Paul. And so there was a certain fellowship that they enjoyed, enjoyed together. And um, God has this way of strengthening us in our trials. See, what we think is when we're going through hard times and we're having doubts and we're having emotional difficulties and spiritual difficulties, we think God has abandoned us. But the truth is that, that he's waiting for us to seek him and, and to be encouraged by the body of, of the Christian, fellow Christians. And that is the fellowship of the suffering. Um, so, okay. And the fellowship of suffering being conformed to his death. Um, so, not suffering for suffering's sake, but as a result of seeking God. Um, so we become like Christ by struggling. That's a hard thing to wrap our heads around, but the truth is if we didn't have struggles, we wouldn't have opportunity to become like Christ. Think of it like when the when the um, Israelites came out of Egypt and they're getting ready to go into the promised land. And... Um, they say, no, we're not going, and so God has them live in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation dies off and the next gener generation goes. Uh, and See, they had everything they could ever want. They they had all the uh, they didn't have to hunt for food. God gave them food with the manna from heaven. Their clothes didn't wear out. Um, they didn't have any wars. I mean, things were going real smooth, but that was, that was a curse. See, the next generation got the blessing, but with that blessing, they had to fight in Canaan. They had to go and live an uncomfortable life. They had to face loss and hardship. But in that loss and hardship, there was victory and there was blessings. See what I mean? And it's the same for for Christianity. We, we think we can just kind of exist. But if we just exist out there, you know, God won't be able to work in us. So, um, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection... Um, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So we want to experience victory without struggle. We can only know God's power by enduring the suffering. We also help each other and grow in faith more in troubles. So, becoming like him in his death by being found in him. Skip through this stuff here. So uh, a rewording of that would be that I may come to trust in him more, overcome trials, be remade, become like Christ from struggles, and in this way be conformed to his death. That would, that's basically a, a rewording of what he's saying. I know we went through a lot of different points there, and I thought it was a little bit unclear, so I thought if I retranslated it for you guys, you guys get kind of the overflow of what I'm saying. So if somehow I might attain, he says in, in verse... Um, I mean, in, in verse 11, he says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's the NASB. Some of the translations say, um, make it sound a little bit more up in the air, like I might not. Uh, what does the CSB say in uh, verse um, 10? 
No, I'm sorry, 11. Chapter 3, verse 11. Assuming that I will somehow reach the... Right there. Assuming that I may somehow. Yeah. See see how it's more... The CSB kind of draws attention to it. Uh, the NASB, for whatever reason, kind of glosses over. What do you have? New King James. Go ahead and read that. Verse 11. If I... If by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. That kind of carries it over too. If by any means I might. There, it, it's kind of this hesitancy. And that's caused people to ask the question, was he not sure? And so for that, there's there's two obvious reasons. The, the first one I, I don't really agree with, but it's out there. Um, some people think that he was talking about the rapture. Maybe I might live to see the rapture. But I don't think that's what he's saying at all. I think what he's saying is anyone can fall away. And he'd been in ministry long enough, and, and he was facing his death. He, he'd seen he he'd walked with God long enough to see that people that you never think would fall away sometimes do. You know, um, for instance, he talks about this in First or Second Timothy, I forget which, about how many have gone away because of the love of money. You know, and in Hebrews it talks about people leaving the faith, and um, in the books of the letters of John he talks about it too. Um, and I think that that's what Paul is saying. He's 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 been in ministry long enough to see that anybody can fall, even Paul, even him, even the great giant of the faith, Paul, can fall. And, and he's just simply acknowledging that. Um, in in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, hopefully I will stay the course until then. Do you think Do you think the falling away that he's just, that he mentioned just now is that the same as the great apostasy? No, I think he was talking about him personally, himself personally. I, I don't think he was talking about uh, people in general. He could have been. He could have been. I just don't. Um, if he was, he was being real cryptic about it, you know. So, but yeah. maybe. Um, okay, so that takes us to verse twelve. Not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I also uh, was laid hold of by. Christ Jesus. Now there is what's called a chiasm here. Don't worry about it if you don't know what that is. We're going to look at it next week. Um, so Paul was not able to coast, but he pressed forward. See, we think that there's going to be a point in our Christian life where we reach this level of growth that we don't, we're good. But that's exactly what Paul doesn't say. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. So God and Paul are seeking the same goal. I press on so that I may lay hold of that which was also um, which for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. So here, Paul and him are, are they're both working towards the same goal here that Paul would lay hold of this thing. Um, then in verse 13, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. So it's not about his past failures or successes, such as his you know, strong ethnic birth or his accomplishments in the law or any of that kind of stuff. Or you know, the great achievements that he's done even after he's been saved. It's not about any of those things. Um, it's basically think of it like um, another lap okay, in a race. One more lap to go. Uh, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead – Think of it, think of it like, like a lap. Okay, you're running a race. Let's say there's three laps. You did two laps. Well, your first lap was a little bit weak. You had some, some mistakes. The second lap, you, you caught up, and you, you really gained and closed in the ground. Well, okay, that's great. I can relax now. No, there's still the third lap, and that's kind of what Paul's kind of talking about here, reaching forward to what lies ahead. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not glorying in the past successes or moping in the past failures. I'm pressing forward to what lies ahead. Excuse me. So then that takes us to verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what is this thing that he keeps talking about in verse 12 and 13? This this thing that he's trying to hold on to? It's the heavenly re reward. Uh, the resurrection of the dead, the upward call. That's the thing that he's, that he's talking about here. So um, there is some reference here in, in his... The, his choices of words. There was um, chariot races that were going on at this time, and um, when the winner, they would go forward to claim the prize. Um, 
um, there was a, like a judge thing that was raised higher, and you would walk towards it to get your your prize. And that, it seems like he's using the vocab, the, the imagery of that, in, in by his choice in, in Greek words here. So, anyways, uh, I press on toward the goal of the uh, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, so then in verse 15, let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. So he, he's talking about possibly two different things. First off, he might be using perfect as a, as a means of sarcasm. You know what I mean? Like if you if you are perfect, sarcasm, you're not perfect, uh, have this attitude. And if anything you have a different attitude, don't worry about it. God will reveal that also to you. He'll, he'll help us to think the same. Which um, is mature. Right, 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 and that's what I have here. Um, if he, if it should be translated mature instead of perfect, then what he's saying is, if any of you are mature, or if any of you are, you know, matured in the faith, a strong Christian, that kind of stuff. Um, in which case, he would be referring in chapter two. Remember, he said that the signs of maturity were um, not complaining and that stuff. So, anyways, um, so yes. Um, it's one of those two possibilities. Um, I'm not really going to tell you guys which view to take. It doesn't really matter. You take whichever one you want because um, it could be translated either way. Um, and if – what does the CSB have? Uh, NASB is obviously perfect, and KJV uh, is mature. mature. You, can, yeah. you have mature too? Yeah. Um, it's kind of tricky translating some things. Um, and so there's always a little bit of room of error. I know some people <laughs> think that, you know – some people are sold on certain translations. Translations are always have their little mistakes. I, I am a big fan of the NASB, but there's a lot of things in there that's just like, well, I don't really think that that's what it's saying. You just have to look at the original Greek. Right, right. Um, well, even then, though, sometimes, sometimes when you're translating, it's 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 a little bit unclear. <coughs> you know what I mean? Like there's this part in Matthew, for instance, where he says, um, "Whatever you loose um, on on earth will be loosed in heaven." Or it could also be translated, whatever you loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult in translating. And the problem is is that we speak English. <laughs> and so it's even more difficult trying to get in their heads and figure out what they're doing. But anyways, um, so he's either saying, uh, being sarcastic or saying, think like this, either or. Um, either way, either way the, the, the end goal of what he's saying is the exact same. We should be thinking like this. So what if I don't? What if I'm not thinking about thinking about this like Paul's thinking about it? Well, he answers that at the end of the verse. And if I'm any, and if anything, you have a different attitude. God will reveal that also to you. So it's not I have found, I find my own way, and you find your own way. Find whatever works for you. That's not what he's saying. He's saying God moves us all to His truth. If you don't agree with what I'm saying, don't worry about it. God will help you to get on this page because I have been seeking God, and this is what God has said. And as you seek God, He will help you to think like this too. So, I I just love that because how many of you guys know that nowadays everything is about find your own, find your own path, you know, right. find your own arrow, you know. There's no absolute truth. You just kind of. But what Paul's saying here is this is the way that we should be thinking. And if you don't think like this, God will reveal that to you also. You know, that's just like wow. There there is a standard, and there's just some kind of security in that that I don't have to invent my own my own way. So um. One thing to note, though, that is just a side note here. Uh, immature people want to learn from immature people because it's easier. Mm -hmm. See, what we do is we find teachers who more, more. don't push us. Yeah, don't challenge. Right. Yeah. We, we like to feel comfortable. Right. I mean, who wants to have trials and temptations and struggles and difficulties? Oh. Who, who wants to do that? Nobody. <laughs> we don't want. We don't want to do that. <laughs> and if we can find a teacher that helps us to just, it's okay. I don't have to grow. I don't have to learn. I can just coast. Right. Well, that we'll do that. Let let's do that. <laughs> you know. So there's always that struggle. We'll pick up here next week. Um, I already went went over. So um, if you have any questions, write them down for next. Well, I we have a little more time. Does anybody have any questions for tonight? Comments. Okay. Read through this a couple times and, and see about kind of the flow that I was talking about. And then come back and, and watch what I said and, and, and just kind of, <coughs> if you have any questions, make sure to bring them for next week. Um, and so the question, the riddle of the week, he has married many women but has never been married. Who is he? King Solomon. No, no, no. Oh. Don't answer yet. Don't answer yet. Uh, 
And don't look at you can't look up the answers online. Alright, you got it. And you ha remember it's a riddle, so it's gonna be something that's 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 tricky. Oh, I think I know who it is. Don't say anything, don't say anything. And then next week, um give